I just want to encourage, um, I encourage you guys for a few minutes today. I, I was asking Holy Spirit, I was just like, what, you know, what do you want me to, to, you know, just encourage this church with? And he just said, you know, I, I really want to come after disappointment in the house. And I was like, okay, all right, that's a big one, but that's all right. And so um, I, I'm, I'm just going to... Um, I'm, I'm going to just read a scripture that the Lord had, had given me uh, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago. And when I read it, I just was pretty blown away by um, how God um, is so willing to come after our disappointment, but then show us some things about it that I think we are so in need to do. And so if you've got Bibles, you can um, turn to me. I'm reading out of the NIV, um, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to start in... Verse 8, we're in Elisha's um, journey now. He has received the mantle from Elijah. He's received this double portion from the prophet Elijah. Elijah did all of these really beautiful things, um, really hard, difficult things. Um, but Elisha is now walking in the anointing and the mantle of Elijah. And he has this, um, this encounter by um, these repeat visits into this town in um, Shuman. And I'm just going to start on verse one. It says, one day Elisha went to Shuman and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. And she said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. And one day when Elisha came, he went up to the room and he lay down there. And he said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. And Elisha said to him, tell her you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army, she replied, I have a home among my own people. Basically, no, thank you. What can be done for her, Elisha asked, and Gehazi said she has no son, and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about that time, she gave birth to his son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. His father told his servant, carry him to his mother. And after the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door and went out. And she called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants in a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today? He said, it's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, look, there is the Shunammite. Run to her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. And when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took a hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She's in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes. Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your coat, cloak into your belt and take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay the staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and he followed her. Gehazi went on ahead, laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went up back to meet Elijah and said, the boy's not awakened. And then Elijah reached the house where the boy lying, was lying on the uh, lying dead on his couch. And he went in, shut the door on the, uh, on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And then he got on the bed, laid 
the boy, on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, and he stretched himself out on him, and the boy's body grew warm, and Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room, and then got back on the bed, stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times, opened up his eyes, and Elijah seven Gehazi, call the Shunammite, he said. When she came in, he said, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground, took her son, and went out. So this is a pretty intense story. For all the mothers in this room, this is a very intense story. Um, I have a son by way of adoption. When I was in my late 30s, um, I had an encounter with the Lord in Romania, and the Lord told me to adopt a baby. And I thought, oh, he's asking me to adopt a baby to see if I'll do it because he's about ready to give me a husband. Okay, so yes, Lord, I'll do it. And the Lord said, I'm not waiting for your life to get convenient before you obey me. And he said, I father the fatherless. I'm asking you to start mothering the motherless. And so I adopted in the South. I'm not from the South. I was born and raised in Southern California. I find myself living in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I bring home a brand new newborn black African baby. And when my cleaning lady looked in my little bassinet and saw him, she said, are you gonna be okay? She said, them kind give you lots of trouble. And I was introduced to the racist self. So sometimes God calls us to things that we don't know that we're equipped for. And I can't imagine ever losing my child or ever having God give me something that I grew disappointed in because of the timing of the Lord. And then God give it to me. Here is a story of a, of a man of God who is a traveling minister and he repeat, uh, does repeat visits into a town and he has a meal at a house of a wealthy couple, a woman married to an older man and we don't know her story. We have no idea what her story is except by way of these little bits and pieces that surface and all of a sudden we're very aware of the amount of disappointment that's heavy in her soul. But she doesn't talk about it anymore because sometimes disappointment can rot your bones out. And so you learn not to talk about it. You just move on with your life. But if God were to come and try to do anything to you, you would push him to the side and say, not today. I'm not going down that road anymore. I'm not doing this thing anymore because you've already cost me years and years of hope I cannot handle any longer. So I'll serve you. I'll serve the house. I'll serve this man. I'll even build the boy a, a, a room. I'll build a guest house for this guy because I do want to serve the Lord. I do see that you're a man of God and I'm still righteously walking with the Lord. Can you be disappointed and still be blameless. According to scripture, you can. According to scripture, you can still serve God and be carrying around a bunch of stuff that God has to one day eventually take out of your life. And the house of God is full of levels of disappointment because of the timing of God. We, in our humanity, we don't understand the timing of God, and so we struggle. I have this wild card friend I mean, she is the wildest card I've ever met in my life. She's probably in her middle to late 60s. Her, her story is the most horrendous story I've ever heard in my life. She wrote a self kind of um, uh, a published book. Um, she had it on Amazon. I met her in the backyard one day of a friend's house while I was living in Dallas. She's a landscape designer, owns a pretty well-to-do landscape company. And she came to assess their backyard. And I was there. And I struck up a conversation with her. And I was like, you are the strangest woman I've ever met in my life. And she said, well, I wrote a book. You can read my story. And when I read her story, I called her up and I said, I just need to meet with you. I mean, it's very poetic. You almost have to be a, a poetic person to read your story. Everybody has a nickname. You don't really know anybody in the story's name, real name. Her brothers are just called the three boys. Um, her father's name is Skillet because he used a skillet to beat them. She's dying of a disease that is so rare, and it's some neurological disease when you are hit so violently so many times, your brain um, loses its ability to, um, to process things in your body. And so her brain says, you can't eat protein or process protein. 
So she lives on noodles and butter because she cannot handle anything else in her body and her heart is failing because of it. And yet she finally has this encounter. You know, her story is a wild story, but her story goes that she got the account of a massive construction guru in Dallas and she said he wasn't saved when she started working for him and, and mowing the lawns and doing the landscape of this construction site where they were building a new development. And one day she notices he starts whistling into work and he just seems happy all the time. And he starts to talk to her about this, this God guy that she wants nothing to do with because she basically cursed God and said, don't ever come back into my life when her twins died. And she, you know, would go to church when she was little because her father, who was the massive abuser, was the deacon um, at their local church. And so she hadn't seen her father in 20 years. Now she had her own company. Um, even her life prior to that is pretty uh, insane. But Jesus, God, Christianity, religion was nothing she wanted. But he invites her to this, you know, this camp where... Um, he, he says, you know, God will meet you in this camp. And she's like, I ain't going to your Jesus camp. And then all of a sudden she realizes, I may lose this account. <laughs> so she's like, all right, all right, all right. I'll go to your stupid Jesus camp. And it's this actually beautiful camp in Texas where it's, you just deal with your stuff. And the last day they send all of these people that have registered for this very expensive camp that he paid for to go out into the wilderness and ask God five questions. And so she basically goes out into the wilderness with these five questions and says, beepity, beepity, beep, 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 beep. That's what I think of you, God. And she tells God off in the wilderness. And she falls on her face and she's crying and she said she's mixed with dirt and sweat and tears and she's just telling God off. And she hears a voice, an audible voice say, are you done? And she looks up, and there's an old man, older man with overall bibs, sitting on a rock with his hands in his pocket about 150 yards from her. And she's like, yes, I'm done. And I'm like, wait, 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 Lisa, did that freak you out? And she said, N no. I, I mean, I didn't know that it was the Lord, and I wasn't a Christian. I thought the guy in overalls showed up to everybody that wanted Jesus. So she has no recollection of how God would ever show up in our lives. So he's in overalls with his hands in his pocket, and he says, are you done? And she says, I'm done. And he says, well, that's good. I've been longing to meet you. She said, well, who are you? And he said, I'm that, I'm that man you're so mad at. And she said, you're, you're God? He said, no, ma'am. He said, I'm real dad. You've never had one. I'm the real thing. So she never calls him God. She never calls him Jesus. She's always like, real dad talked to me last night. Real dad was talking to me last night. She has every excuse, every excuse. And so she's wild card. She's wild card. You know, it's, 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 it's precious being with her. You know, she said, real dad turned around and introduced her that afternoon to the triplets. And I'm like, the triplets? He's like, yeah, I guess you call him the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he calls them the triplets. I was talking to her on the phone one day, and we were talking about just stuff that was going on in my life, and she said, man, you sound really disappointed in, in real dad. And I'm like, I mean, I love him. It's not like I'm mad at him. She goes, no, but you know what? Your disappointment can erode your soul. Like, she's like, you should take real dad to therapy. And I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, I mean, just take him into therapy. Just close your eyes, take him into a therapist's office, have Holy Spirit mediate for you. And I'm like, are you serious? And she's like, yeah, just put yourself in a quiet place. It's the best therapy in the whole wide world, and it doesn't cost you anything. So I'm crazy enough to try this kind of stuff. And I sat down, and I closed my eyes one afternoon, and I was like, I'm taking you to therapy, real dad. Get in here, you know. Had the Holy Spirit mediate for me, so I see the Holy Spirit sitting there on one side, and 
and Jesus walks in and sits on the other side, and I'm sitting there, and the Holy Spirit looks at me and says, what are we here today to, to talk about? And I'm like, I'm mad at him. I'm disappointed in him. And the Holy Spirit says, well, do you have something you want to talk to him about? And I said, yeah. I said, I need, I need to ask him a question about his perfect timing. And so Holy Spirit looks at Jesus and says, you know what? She has a really valid question for you. Can you answer her? And when, when, I, when I saw that in, the, in this vision that I'm having, you can call me crazy. I felt validated in my struggle for the first time. I felt validated by the Holy Spirit just saying, she has a valid question for you. And so Jesus looks at me and he said, I can answer this question for you. And I was like, I would really appreciate that. And he said, well, perfect timing from, from, from the deity of who I am, from the divinity of who I am, when it's placed in your path, it's usually placed in your path when you are in a wrestle and full of tension with some kind of circumstance in your life that you're wanting me to attend to and I'm not getting there fast enough for you. So when you meet me on the road with my perfect timing, you come at me with the tension of it. And perfect timing is perfect peace. And you can't see perfect peace when you come on the road with your chaos. Your human chaos and your human tension and that human stuff that doesn't understand that comes in and meets me with your confusion will never be able to actually embrace perfect timing. So the reason that you don't understand it is because every time you meet it, it's in conflict with where you're at. And for, 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 for that moment for me, I just, it meant everything. It just, it was, I mean, like, I just could hear something just drop in the, in the spirit. And I was like, you're absolutely right. I never am in question with you unless I'm in tension. And he said, next time you're in tension, why don't you stop? pull over and admit to your tension, admit to your confusion, ask for the peace of God to come, for the understanding and the revelation of God to come, and then sit in that before you and I talk about perfect timing. Elisha meets this woman in scripture, and she's serving him, and she's She's gracious and kind about it, and so he's just wanting to do her a favor. What can I do? Can I talk to the king for you? Can I talk to the commander of the army? Can, can we do something for you? Can we give you something in that? Um, because of how you've given to us, I've got influence. I can give you something. And she says, I have my own people in my own house. I'm good. So all, we're seeing in scripture the tension of, no, 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 that's fine. I don't need anything. I'm not doing this to get anything from you. Already been down that road. We're not doing that anymore. And so he says, Gehazi, what is this woman like? Is there something like, what does she want? And he's like, well, I know she's barren. She's childless. Her husband's old. And Elisha's like, bring her in here. This time next year, you're going to have a, you're gonna have a baby. And if that's a desire of your heart, the last thing you think somebody would say is, no, 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 my Lord, that's okay, in objection. But she says, no, 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 we're not doing this. We're not doing this. I don't need that. I'm not, don't say another word. We're not going down this road. All of a sudden, her disappointment is thrown up into the room. And she all of a sudden reveals the pain and the agony because God hasn't met her in these areas that he, she want, probably for years and years and years wanted him to meet her. I, I talk to, to, uh, to um, women um, trying to have babies all the time and, and I say to them, look, I know you're angry with the Lord, but I have read this thing. Everybody that wants a baby gets a baby. In here, everybody that wants a baby gets a baby in here. Now, there's timing involved in it, but everybody, uh, I mean, there's more stuff about the barren woman here. And so this is a hopeful book for women trying to conceive a baby. It is a hopeful book. But there are places in us where we are like, we, I, this is the line. This is the line of scrimmage from where God can come anymore. I can't do it anymore. 
I can't do false hope anymore. And so she gets this prophecy, gets pregnant, has the baby, and maybe three or four years down the road, it sounds like the baby has an aneurysm in the field with its father. And so they bring the, the child to the mother. It sits on her lap. It dies in her arms. As a mother, I cannot even begin to resolve that. But watch what she does. She picks up the son. And she quietly goes upstairs. She lays him down on the bed. She goes right back down. She opens the door. She calls to her servant and she says, saddle me a donkey. And she gets on a donkey. I'm gonna go see this man of God. No word about her dead son. No word about call people in to pray. Come on, let's do resurrection. Let none of that. She's like, no, 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 no. I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm not living like that and then got redeemed and got a promise and then going to see this promise fade away. Though we're not doing that anymore. And so she saddles that donkey and she goes with the servant and Elisha sees her from the distance and he's gripped. But the Lord won't reveal to him why she's coming. Because this is a, this is a, a story where it's not just about one woman. It's also about a prophet how, learning how to be a prophet learning how to be a minister, learning how to carry a mantle that he was just given by his predecessor. So here is this woman. Elisha says, Gazi, go down there and find out what she's, what's going on, man. What's going on? Is her husband okay? Is she okay? What's going on? And so he goes down there, and in a sense, basically what she does is she's like, nothing's wrong, I'm fine. And she just keeps heading toward the prophet. He didn't give her the word. He gave her the word. I have no business with anybody that didn't give me the word. But I'm going to go to the one who gave me the word. And this is exactly what's happening. And so all of a sudden, Elijah's like, Elijah's like, uh, uh, okay, 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 okay. And he's like, uh, Gehazi, go back. Put my staff on there. And if you read prior, when Elisha gets the anointing, um, the first thing he does is put that cloth in the water and sees the, the water separate just like it did for Elijah. So, so these artifacts that he has with him have power on it. So he says, take the staff, go back to the house, lay the staff on the... And she's like, I ain't going back there with the servant. I'm staying right here with the voice and the man who gave me the word. And when you go back, I'll go back. And so they head back. And Gehazi can't do anything for the boy. But Elisha has to get up there. And Elisha has to be like, oh God, oh God, oh God. And then he lays on the boy and he brings the boy back to life. I think there is a season in the church where we're in the season where we had better start saddling a donkey. Because there is disappointment all over the place. And the enemy is killing us with it. I mean, I just, I, I was reading in, um, in just some articles, uh, scientific articles that were written about um, disappointment and review of, you know, um, how people make decisions. And it says disappointment is, is now the leading cause of bad decision making. And uh, Harvard, the Harvard Business Review had this, um, had this article out, and it, it, this is just a little excerpt from it. It said, some people seek to avoid disappointment by turning into underachievers. They unconsciously set the bar low and avoid taking risks to prevent themselves or others from being disappointed. Without realizing it, they have decided that the best strategy is to not have high expectations about anything. Such behavior turns into a form of self-preservation. However, it also leads to a mediocre and unfulfilled life. Ironically, these people often turn into disappointments for everyone, including themselves. How does the enemy steal from us in disappointment? First thing he does, he takes your trust in God. He, takes your, he stalls your hope in the Lord. He um, feeds you with regret for even having asked in the first place. And then he just breeds failure in us. Why ask if he's never going to hear? Why ask if he's never going to hear? I, I had a rough 2023 for a lot of different reasons, but it was probably my most disappointing year in my whole 
life. And part of it is I believe that the Lord takes me into deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper waters with things. And so if I want the more of God, I, it, it, like the Lord's like, if you really want the more of me, you can't use a snorkel. Like you're going to have to, you're going to have to know how to scuba dive deep and find things that you won't find on the surface. If that's really what you want, then, then let's go, but it's going to cost you something. And so I, 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 every time this kind of stuff happens, I'm like, okay, I'm in a process of pushing through stuff and it isn't fun. Let me tell you, it's not fun. I mean, I, I, I sometimes am just like, man, Lord, can I just throw me a bone? Can I just have a break? Like, can I just have a break? But this has cost me everything because this has to be pure for me. And I'm doing this uh, almost 40 years in a, in a new generation that doesn't even know the cost of this. But I'm not, I'm not giving up on it because once you get it in your bones, once you get Jesus in your bones, it really doesn't matter if he comes or not. You just know that he's good regardless. And if you keep pressing through, you will get to the other side. You will get to the other side, and when you get to the other side, you'll have a little bit more strength to encounter and to walk through the next set of series of circumstance, because the world's going to give them to you, regardless of whether you want them or not. You know, I mean, people losing people, God not healing people, you know, I mean, some get their dead back and some get beaten and flogged. I don't know why that is, but he's the same God to both people. And both people can stand and actually have the same thing to say about him. And I remember I was mentoring. I closed the computer. And I had this vision in the midst of this, this stuff that was going on. I had this vision that I'm standing in my dining room where I was. And this tornado is ripping up the street um, of my neighborhood. And it is so violent that I can feel houses across the street begin to vibrate and shake. And the first thing I do in this vision is I call out on the Lord. I said, Jesus, Jesus, help. And the back garage door opens to the door chime and I hear someone whistling up the hallway. And I turn and look in the vision and Jesus is standing in the dining room and with great glee, he says, I found a bike in your garage with a flat tire and I pumped it up for you. <laughs> and I said, there is a tornado about to rip our house to shreds. I don't care about a bicycle. I mean, you can feel the shingles being ripped off the roof of my house. And Jesus stares at me in that dining room and he cocks his head to the side and he says, whoa, it's so sad that you're so focused on what I'm not doing that you cannot even see what I am. And I was in peril for months after that vision because I'm like, I don't want to ride a bicycle. Like, I don't care about the bicycle. Why the bicycle? Why couldn't it have been something else you were doing that made more sense until one day in the backyard, the Lord said to me, what kind of a bike are we talking about? Like a live strong bike, like a 10 speed, like a race bike? I'm like, no, that's not what's in the garage. He's like, what is in the garage, Rita? And I said, that's a... That's a dumb little beachcomber I bought after being at the beach one day. He's like, oh, it's a bike arrest? And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you are in such chaos. The enemy is able to completely distort your view of everything because of all the things around you that you cannot see that what I'm actually inviting you into is rest. You have got to learn how to rest. And I just collapsed. And I was like, I don't know how. I don't know how. He's like, where does it say you have to do it alone? And I came to the point of disappointment. It's like, I think I'm just disappointed. I'm disappointed that here we are again. And that's when he began to speak to me. You know, he'd talk to me about writing this new record. And I was like, dude, I am in my 50s. Like, I do not need to do another record. Leave that for the young people that want to do it. There's so much disappointment. He's like, hmm, disappointment in the industry? I'm like, yes. I don't, I don't want to put out another project with all this vision and then have the industry destroy it. I'm like, I, I just can't do it anymore. And, and he's like, but I'm asking you because the church needs what you have and I'm asking you to do it. And when have you ever said no? 
And I'm like, are you having? That's the point. You know, it's like, I always say yes. Can't I just say no this once? And he said, Rita, you said you want to go deeper. You say you want to retire. Don't you think you can get to the other side of this season? And so I remember when I said, okay, I'll go in and write for this next record. And I said, but you're going to have to give me the name of the record. And he said, you're going to call this one Fed by Ravens. And I'm like, that's why I'm in this season. You know, and the Lord's like, wait, hang on. I'm not putting you in a season to get a record out of you. That would be mean. He's like, I'm ask, actually giving you lyrics and melodies for the church who's in a season that I want them to find me still miraculous even if I don't provide the miracle. And I think, you guys, I, I think we do that a lot. I think if we don't get the miracle, all of a sudden God becomes a different shade of a color. Because, well, there's all these miracles in here. Well, sometimes the miracle is in, is in the wait. Sometimes the miracle is in the desert. Sometimes the miracle isn't what you think it's going to be, but the miracle becomes something that he brings you instead, and you have to actually see it as the miracle. I, I'm just going to um, really quick go to another story before we close. Um, and it's out of Luke chapter 1. It's actually the birth of John the Baptist. And in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, it says, um, it's talking about this couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Um, Elizabeth, it says, was also a descendant of Aaron. And it said, both of them, in verse 6, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commands, decrees, and blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. And once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembly worship leaders were praying outside. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be of joy and great delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never take wine or fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Ladies, would it not have been amazing if an angel of the Lord appeared to us before we had children and said, this is what this baby's going to be. He's, he's never going to smoke a joint behind the bleachers of the high school. You know, he's never going to do anything wrong. He's always going to take out the garbage when you say to take out the garbage. You know, that would be amazing if an angel of the Lord visited every woman to tell every woman what their child was going to be. This is an insane, an insane visitation from the Lord. And Zechariah looks at the angel in verse 18 and says, how can I be sure of this? And all of a sudden, all of Zechariah's disappointment comes throwing up in the temple. The angel doesn't have one bad piece of bad news. That's a pretty, pretty decent prophecy about your kid. And Zechariah because he's waited so long for this baby, because he's not hoping anymore for this baby. Now his wife's old for this baby, and you expect me to believe this is possible. And God's like, we're cutting off the sound of your voice. I thought that was kind of harsh. And I remember I said to the Lord, why did you do that? Like the, the guy was broken. And he said, Rita, how long does it take for a woman to have a baby? And I said, well, I've never had one, but they say almost 10 months. He's like, you wanted me to listen to that doubt for 10 months over that woman? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, she's an old woman and she's pregnant. You think he's going to keep his mouth shut? Like, I hope you, uh, you uh, don't lift that. What, uh, what are you doing? Uh, with, the whole time of, of that, that resident disappointment being in there, he would, may have ruined the whole thing. Because when you speak, your words come out your mouth and they fall right onto your soul. 
And our souls cannot handle any more disappointment when God's trying to move and do something. And do you know why it took all that time? When you look at this story and you realize, you know, sweet Elizabeth doesn't have the same um, encounter. When she gets pregnant, she hides herself away for five months and nobody knows it. Five is the number for grace. I think she had to find grace again with the power of the Lord and the voice of God. And then when she comes down the mountain, there's a 14-year-old girl coming up the mountain. And when her baby, that prophesied baby that her husband doubted, that they had such great disappointment in, even though they were following all the commands of the Lord, can sense the Messiah in that 14-year-old's belly. He does a twist. And Elizabeth, by way of the Holy Spirit's like, God has chosen you among all women to carry the Messiah. If, I, if God had ever given her that baby 30 years, 40 years prior, there would have been no Mary. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Why do we spend so much time being so disappointed by what God won't do for us when he's just trying to get it done? I don't know where our disappointment is. I don't know where your disappointment is. You know, my sister, 14 months older than I was, we shared a room our whole lives. And when she was seven, apparently we were so poor. We never went to the doctor, couldn't afford to go to the doctor. She had so many ear infections that her left eardrum had collapsed. And so I remember she went in for a massive surgery. At that point, they cut her ear completely off, laid it across her face, reconstructed her eardrum. I believe she had that same surgery four times as a little girl because her eardrum would just collapse all the time. She has no hearing in her left ear. And now she's losing all the hearing in her right ear. And 20 years ago, I was in a woman's conference and the power of the Lord broke out and the Holy Spirit said to me, I'm gonna heal your sister's ears. I'm going to give her her hearing back. So I dialed my sister you know, at the break, and I was like, I'm giving you this word from the Holy Spirit. God's going to heal your ears. And she was like, thank you. My sister, I'm more charismatic. She's a little bit AG, baptist -y. She's like, thank you very much, Rita. I appreciate that. Thank you for praying for me. Like, I'm not kidding you. I will, I will not relent. I will be praying for you. God is going to heal your ears. And 20 years later, now she's losing all the hearing in her right ear. And I saw her a few weeks ago, and she just collapsed sobbing. And she says, I am, I am sinking into silence. She said, and I, I have more fear in my life than I've ever had before. She said, if I, if I start living where I can't hear my grandchildren's voices, I don't know what I'm going to do. She goes, Rita, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just covered in fear. And I was like, God told me 20 years ago he's going to heal you. And so she called, and she, we were talking about this, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing on Instagram. I'm going to get people praying. I'm just going to get hundreds of thousands of people praying for you. We're going to get your ears here healed. We're going to get your ears healed. And she said, hold off. Somebody gave me the name of this doctor in Seattle that I'm going to go see. Um, I've seen four of them already, and nobody can help me. They've given me this diagnosis and blah, 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 blah. She said, but I, we're getting new insurance, and I could go see this guy, so I'm just going to go see this guy. Let me call you next week. So she calls me a week later and she said, she goes to this guy's office and he's like, looks at all of her stuff and he says to her, okay, I'll start with the left one. I'm just going to drill a hole in the back of your ear and I'm going to do this. And she said he just became like Charlie Brown's parents. And she said, excuse me? And he said, well, I'll give you the hearing back in your left ear first. And she's like, wait, what? He goes, well, it's this new procedure that I'm doing now. It's all I do. And you're a perfect candidate for it. This is what we're going to do based on blah, blah, blah. We're going to da, 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 and put this little device in it. It'll expand the station tube, and then you'll have full hearing in your left ear. And he said, then I'll work on the right. And she said, you're going to give me full hearing back in both ears. And he said, yeah, do you want that? And she said she fell on the floor of the doctor's office, and she just started sobbing. Because 20 years ago, that doctor wasn't doing that surgery. <laughs> that surgery wasn't even invented yet. Sometimes God doesn't, he doesn't heal you. 
radically heal you. Sometimes he needs the obedience of other people to, to be enlightened by the power of heaven and the power of, of how to do things and how to work with the body. And I think doctors can be like that. And that was her miracle. And I just was like, whoa, Lord, who am I to ever have been disappointed that you waited 20 years when you're giving her not just her deaf ear back, but you're giving her both ears back? I mean, like, what? And I just, I was just so undone. And I felt like the Lord's like, isn't my way kind of cooler? <laughs> I don't know where you guys are today. All I know is that he's good and he wants us to lay down our disappointment. And um, I'm going to go to the piano and just sing over you. And we're going to close. I'm going to hand it over to, to, to Pastor. And I'm going to sing a song that, um, it's not even out yet, but it's a song that for me started breaking the disappointment of, of 2020 to 2023 off of my life. Because the Lord said, you know, write a first song, but I want you to call it Amen with an exclamation point because I knew Amen meant so be it. This will be my last word. Amen. Whatever you do, whatever you call me to. And that doesn't mean that we lose out or we miss out or that we live um, unsatisfied. None of that means anything. It means that we find the peace of the Lord and we feel like he's just done everything we've ever needed. That's really what it feels like. Because you can find a place in Jesus where he overcompensates for all of what has happened to us. And when we start cutting the tethers to the floating docks of regrets and bitterness and disappointment and unforgiveness and all those things in our lives and we move forward, God actually can begin to give us our things. And maybe this morning, some of you need to saddle a donkey. Maybe this morning, some of you need to write on a piece of paper like Zachariah, before he got his voice back, his name is John. It wasn't until Zachariah solidified what God was doing that God returned the sound of his own voice and trusted the sound of his own voice. Maybe some of you need to write on a piece of paper, I believe you're gonna do this. I believe you're gonna heal this. I believe you see our finances. I believe you're healing my husband. I believe you can heal my marriage. I believe maybe these are decrees you guys need to make because you haven't seen it and you haven't seen it and you haven't seen it. But that's my encouragement to you today is, oh, God's appointed with us. He doesn't want us to be disappointed in him. So I hope that makes sense. I guess maybe you can take the pulpit away. <laughs> I think we have, um, I think we have the lyrics And then I know that there's a prayer team here. I think, um, and Pastor, Pastor can, he'll, do whatever needs to be done. I'm sure my pastor. But man, if, if you're here this morning and you just um, and you just you just need to uh, tell the Lord, you know, I'm sorry that I've doubted you. I'm sorry that I've just lived with this kind of disappointment, and I just give it all to you, Jesus.
So be it, you have seen me. Your word won't come back empty. I trust you so completely. This will be my last word. Oh, this will be my last word. Amen. When the brook dries up. Amen. From an empty cup. Amen. When there's not enough. God, hear me say it again. Amen. From the wilderness. Amen. From the lion's den. Amen. When there's nothing left. God, hear me say it again. Amen. God, hear me say it again. Your oil never runs, never runs, and never runs out. You provide every time, every time, every time. Why would I doubt it? Your oil never runs, never runs, and never runs out. You provide every time, every time, every time. Why would I doubt it? Sing that out. Why would I doubt it? 